Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 156. How do Python virtual environments work under the hood? How does understanding these concepts help you with managing them for your projects? This week on the show, CPython core developer Brett Cannon returns to discuss his recent articles about virtual environments and the Python packaging landscape. Brett talks about his recent article, How Virtual Environments Work. He was researching the topic to solve an issue with a Linux Python distribution that doesn't provide the tools to create virtual environments. We talk about how he solved the problem by creating a tiny library named MicroVimv. We also take a look at the Python packaging ecosystem. Brett talks about the early days of Python, where these tools didn't exist. He contrasts that with the current packaging solution explosion and how each one attempts to solve unique problems. We also discuss the Python Packaging User Survey and the plans for packaging summits at PyCon US. And a programming note here, we recorded this episode two weeks before PyCon US 2023. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Brett, welcome back. Thanks. It's uh, good to talk to you again a little bit longer about, I thought we could talk about virtual environments and packaging a little bit. I know we were already kind of discussing packaging a little bit along with the Wazi Wasm stuff that we were discussing earlier. You've had a handful of posts on your blog about packaging and virtual environments. And I think this kind of lands a little more squarely in your day job kind of stuff. Is Would that be correct to assume? Uh, yes and no. It depends on what you're talking about. If it's the virtual environment stuff, then definitely yes. If it's packaging, kinda. Okay. (laughs) Well, you had, um, a bunch of little posts, uh, kind of going back a a little while. I think I'll maybe start with Mm -hmm. one of the more recent ones. I did discuss this on the show recently, bringing it up as a topic. The blog post was how virtual environments work. And I kind of found it really fascinating, this idea of under the hood, what's truly happening. And it's very different from like how to use them, which is always the instructional stuff that we do on Real Python, And we have lots of Mm -hmm. courses on that. But it's like, no, how is the actual thing like structured? Like if you were going to yourself build a virtual environment from the ground up and you went down this path for kind of an interesting reason that is related to your day job. Is that right? Yeah. So... For the Python extension of VS Code, we we want to help users be successful. And part of that, from our perspective and my perspective as well, is getting people to use environments more, whether they're virtual environments or content environments, right? We, yeah. we have found enough people who have messed up their machines or messed up their Python install or just wondering what the heck's going on because they didn't set up an environment that we wanted to kind of do what we could to kind of push people in that direction. And we know it's a slight stumbling block for people when they want to, when they don't know about it to begin with, or if they do, they don't quite know what to do. Sure. And so we're starting to take the first steps in, towards that. And the first thing we did was we created, we added this create environment command to VS Code, which will ask you what kind of environment you want. Uh, right now asks if you want a virtual environment or a content environment. Okay, interesting. And for this conversation, we'll go down the we'll go down the virtual environment path, and then after you say that, we ask what what Python interpreter that we found. Uh, we call them global globally installed interpreters. Okay, but basically the ones you've installed on your machine. Like, which one do you want to use to create this virtual environment? And then we create the virtual environment right using the Venv module, and then uh, in your dot in, in a dot venv directory in the workspace. Slightly controversial for some people. The current workspace that's up right now or working. Yeah, the directory you opened inside of VS Code itself. We call that the workspace. Basically, we put it in the .venv directory because it's the closest I can find to commonality in the community around this name because it's either that or just venv without the lean 
thought, the period. Yeah. And that's actually something I found out through one of my polls that we talked about on a previous episode of yeah. Ask the Community, like, do people do this? And there was no consensus. There was no majority of anything. So I went with .vnv um, because it hides it in VS Code from searches. And usually people, when they search code, they don't want to look inside their virtual environment. They just want to search in their own code. So it shrinks the search space, makes it easier to navigate their code. Yeah. So that's why we, we did that. And honestly, the community seems in general do that as well. Roughly, it's not 50-50 absolute, but relative 50-50.vnv to vnv without it. So we just went with it. So that hidden file, just to kind of pause you for a second. Yeah. I know it's usually like a system wide thing as far as like how the operating system windows or mac i'm not sure on linux chooses to show uh, hidden things does vs code pay attention to that and and show it or does it automatically show it it automatically shows it it just uh will gray it out a bit okay to kind of just signify that well sorry i take that back it will show it and then whether or not it's tracked by your version control system will dictate whether it's great or not but on VS Code, we always show it. And actually, I think Windows shows dot .files consistently at this point. The Mac, by default, has it off, and it's like Shift-Command period or something like that, or, yeah. or Space or something, yeah. So, um, I mean, from our perspective, the virtual environment is borderline uh, implementation detail for your getting your work done, so it's not something we kind of want staring people in the face either. So this is once again one of the disagreements in the community when i brought this up is well yeah but you don't want to hide it because then people can't see it it's like well actually i kind of do because i don't think it's something anyone cares about most users just want to install things and we're trying to help them not break their system and their python install by installing everything everywhere into the one spot in their global install yeah so i kind of do view it as something you shouldn't see some people dislike it People have opinions. And it's kind of that thing with the recent PEP also, right? The one where, I'm not sure the status of it, where uh, it was going to suggest to you, hey, it looks like you're installing, <laughs> Clippy style, hey, it looks like you're installing things and you didn't, aren't putting them in a virtual environment. Are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, so that <laughs> PEP actually just got rejected. I can't remember if Purdue okay. physically rejected it himself or if he withdrew it. But mm, okay, that just happened, I think, literally maybe this week. And yeah, that PIP suggested PIP by default uh, require a virtual environment, requiring an opt out instead of an opt in. There is actually an environment variable you can set. Yeah. Okay. I think it's PIP underscore requires underscore VIMV or virtual env. And that will cause PIP to fail if you try to do an install into anything but a virtual environment. And then uh, it also said, let's go with the name .venv if you're going to create the virtual environment in the directory with the code. Trying to standardize it. Yeah. Trying to standardize it. So we create it in there. We also put it in the workspace. I had a whole blog post on kind of where virtual environments exist. This also was part of my polling to try to figure out. Yeah, yeah. Do people, like, I hear people go, oh, I want to use virtual and wrapper, and I keep it in this global directory over here, and all that's where all my workspaces are, and et cetera, et cetera. And then I've always just kept it in the directory with the code. Yeah. And it's like, am I the weird one here? Or is it... Well, I definitely do what you do, but I, I, have, I have a really odd workflow because I manage a group of people and the, all of their projects and so i'm kind of testing all their different things and so it, it made sense that i'm going to stand something up and then i'm, I'm going to just delete the whole thing i'm not necessarily gonna have a what i felt like from that survey that you did is there there were a handful of people that have like a, a reusable environment that that is like this is the you know, this is the type of work I do and these are the packages I always use and that I can just always kind of point at this particular environment, which I, I thought was interesting. Like, it's kind of like, you know, like if maybe you or somebody who generates PB, PDFs all day, that's like your main job, that you could reuse this one environment for a, a whole host of different projects, which I, I don't know if that's true. So yeah, I, I so there is, the things seem to break down into kind of, in, in that regard, there was kind of three groups, right? There are the people who, do what it seems like you and I do, right? Where they create the virtual environment in the directory with their code, right? It's it's right. part of that code. It's 
it, it's tied to that code. It's related to that code. So let's keep it in the directory with the code, right? It's temporary, right? But it, and it's not going to probably commit. You don't want to commit it to your virtual environment. And actually, our create environment command actually puts the dot git ignore uh, file in there with nothing but an asterisk to say, don't commit this. Oh, yeah. It plops it in there. Okay, good. So we have that little extra uh, bit. There are other people who want to keep everything in a global directory. And usually they do that because either for cleanliness reasons, they don't like having anything that doesn't, that's not going to go into their version control system in that directory with that. Yeah. So they prefer it out there. Or they really like the idea of having it all in one place so that if they wanted to delete all of their virtual environments at once, because for space reasons, they have one directory to delete and they don't have to go through all their other directories hunting for them. Yeah. I, I personally am one of these people who has a repositories directory and the directory structure follows the org repo structure on GitHub, right? So I actually know exactly where all mine are. So they match pretty well. Yeah. So for me, it's not a big deal, but for some people obviously they just don't work that way. And I totally fine. Uh, so they want all in one directory. And then there's the other one where, as you said, where people have a single environment that they reuse between projects. Yeah. And actually I found Conda users and scientists fall into this camp a lot yeah. more than I was expecting. They don't want to have to set up. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to reset it up. And honestly, their tool, their tool box is very consistent, yeah. right? So like if someone is... Just grab the red box. <laughs> yeah, like if someone's doing a lot of data analysis at a company and it's just like, oh, I, I'm constantly looking at the same kind of data. You're, it, it, it's not totally unreasonable to think like, all right, I'm going to need NumPy, I'll need Pandas or Polars, right? And... Matplotlib or Seaborn or whatever you're using, Jupyter, whatever. But it's the exact same tool set for everything every single time for when you're doing your analysis. Yeah. And so they just want to set that up once and just reuse it because then otherwise they're reinstalling the same thing over and over and over again. And to them seems wasteful. Now, personally, my concern with that is always reproducibility. But once again, if you're using this for yourself to just get a number, right? Like, oh, my man, my boss has said I need to calculate this thing. What's the what's the number? Figure it out. Yeah, I have to figure it out, and then I'm done. I don't have to show my work, or at worst, I have to show them a Jupyter notebook or the output. But I don't have to be able to rerun the numbers again. Yeah, I can kind of get it. But I mean, I think another wrinkle there is maybe the the cloud versions of Jupyter things where all that stuff sort of pre-installed maybe that kind of feels similar yeah um i mean that's kind of if you think back to the anaconda distribution which is like massive and i think most people have moved away from at this yeah. point because it's just so freaking big it is huge <laughs> it's like yeah. over a gig of stuff to download yeah i mean it is interesting when you start to think about that right I, I think for people who are still doing a lot of work on their desktop they have it set up this way but when you start to think about like running stuff in the cloud or having like GitHub code spaces, right? Where you kind of have like an ephemeral machine to do your work in that you can kind of just shut down and toss because everything's just stored in Git and that throw it away. It kind of makes that kind of persistence a problem, yeah. right? Because it just basically means like, I personally am a person where I've, I live my life such that if you were to throw my laptop into the ocean tomorrow, it'd take me no more than half a day at worst to get set up on a new machine because everything I have is backed up somewhere because I've accidentally left, had my laptop end up in Dubai Ugh. when I was going through Vancouver International Airport on the way to the Core Dev Sprints back in 2019. And I learned my lesson. And luckily, I shut my laptop down every day. So I'd already kind of gotten a little paranoid about that. But that really hit it home. It was like, yeah, you don't know when your laptop's going to break. So just make sure if it broke, it would not take long to get another one up and going. So I don't have a, I, so that would never work for me personally, just because the idea of having a magical environment that I keep reusing just seems like I'm asking for trouble. Yeah, that makes sense. Like somehow I'm going to get out of sync and I'll have to reset my machine. Like, oh crap, the stuff I was working on doesn't work because I don't know what was in that. It's like, it's just not how I mentally work. But yeah, that's basically how the groups broke down is the, the people do it locally in their workspace People who do it globally, usually for cleanliness reasons from their perspective or easy maintenance because they want to be able to delete it or they want to reuse one. So it wasn't a one-to-one -one correlation of a workspace to an environment. It was multiple workspaces to a single environment. Very, very rarely I, I found where there was it an M to N where people were kind of using multiple workspaces with multiple virtual, with multiple environments that all map differently. 
I will say the reason, and one of the reasons I ask this is from a tooling perspective. Yeah. It's really hard to connect your code to your environment if it's not in the workspace, right? Like think about it this way. If you have a global directory that has all your virtual environments, how is VS Code as a tool, or any tool, by the way, this is not specific to VS Code, but as an example, how is it supposed to know which virtual environment you want to associate with this? The one that you've updated most recently? (laughs) But we don't know if that was this code base, though, right? It could have been another code base you were working on. So we have this problem of we have to ask you. Yeah. Which kind of sucks. It's, it's, It's a... It's an extra step in terms of getting started, right? We'd much rather have you be able to just open up VS Code and have things just work as best as we can. But especially if you already had it set up before you launched VS Code, right? Like if you had a directory with a project set up, we'd love it if you just launched VS Code for it. And it's just, oh, we pick up everything that's going. It's like, oh, you're ready to just go. Yeah. You're, you're already set up. We're just setting up VS Code to work with what you have. But when you put it in a global space, it's like, I don't know which one you want. <laughs> yeah. So we have to ask you and we have to list all of them. So if you have a bazillion environments in there we have to say well sorry we don't know which one to use you got to tell us out of your 200 which one you want us to pick up so this is why we we personally put it in your workspace because it completely disambiguates its purpose yeah and then after that we ask we we do installation if you have a pyproject.toml and a build system in that table in there we do an editable install for you and then we also ask which optional dependencies, which extras you want to install from that. And we give you a list of that. And then if you also have requirements files, we basically matching the glob star requirements star dot text. We list those and say, which ones do you want us to pass to pip? And then we pass those to pip uh, in your virtual environment and say, install it all. Wow. So the reason we went down this whole road, though, is back to microvenv and this whole thing is the reason I started to blog about this and look into this and how it works is because... On Debian, you do not get Venv in your Python install, nor do you get pip. Yeah, that's really strange. So it's, it's a policy that Debian holds. Basically, for Debian, if you install something from apt-get or apt, it's supposed to represent a single application. To Debian, Venv and pip are separate apps compared to Python. So it goes against Debian policy once again, if you install Python and then you get this second app called Venv and this third app called Pip, so they broke it out. And so that's why when you do app get install Python 3, you don't have Venv and you don't have Pip. But as I said, we're trying to make this easier for beginners. And telling beginners who are using a, a Debian-based OS, which is everyone on Ubuntu, and by the way, everyone who's on a Chromebook that launches Linux, because that's what it's going to happen. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. They're not going to have it. Now, luckily, the Debian project is going to be launching a Python 3 full, I believe it's called, package, which is kind of an umbrella package that includes all of this stuff. But once again, A, that's got to get released. B, it's got to trickle out whether if you're not using Debian to the Linux distro you're using that's based on Debian. And see, you got to know it ex- uh, exists and have the, hopefully have your documentation updated so you know to use it, right? It, it's going to be a while, right? Yeah. So when I took a l- look, I just like, because I was asked at work, like, we need to solve this, right? Because the problem we have at work is the whole VS Code team for one week a month, every release stops coding. And we do what's called end game. And all we do is test the product. Okay. All we do is test every single bug fix we made, every new feature we landed, everything gets hand tested. This is literally like leading to the uh, the word experience in your time. Yeah, 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 right. But I mean, this is the whole VS Code team, me, core side, every extension we're in charge of, like anything we do gets tested during this week. And the problem we were running into were people who were not working on the Python side of stuff, we're being asked to test the Python code and the, the Python experience stuff. Mm. And so they're going like, well, how do I get this working? And we eventually just started to tell people, use dev containers, which is an easy way to basically launch a Docker VM with stuff in it. And it's easy to install Python in a new Docker container, right? You just pull up the terminal and just run whatever installer for that. So people were doing this for Ubuntu because a lot of people like Ubuntu. Uh, I'm a Fedora person personally for various reasons. And they constantly were running into problems, especially with the create environment command. Because like, well, I'm getting this error message. Like, what? And it's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm on a bunch. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you got to install this other stuff. Because once again, they're not typical. I mean, VS Code is written in TypeScript, right? 
Right. So they're not day-to-day Python developers. So they didn't know they had installed Vim. They didn't know they had installed. They didn't need these two other Yeah, they pieces. didn't know about the two extra yeah. steps, the two extra things they had to yeah. install. So my manager's like, yeah, we kind of had to fix this, right? More and more people are going to probably be using dev containers, the default container image that's kind of the kitchen sink one, like even GitHub uh, Codespaces provides. Is Ubuntu based? Luckily, that one does install Vim and Pip because they asked me and I told them install Vim and Pip. So at least that's taken care of. Make sure you do this. <laughs> but in general, people run into this, right? Same thing as I said with Chromebooks, right? Like education place. If you say, "Oh, you're going to use Linux," so we'll just use just install the Linux feature in Chromebook. Well, that's Debian. So we realized we had a problem. Is like, well, can we just give a better error message if it's if Vim's not there for these users, like? Yeah, we could. And I, but I was like, I basically know how this works. This doesn't seem like this should be that complicated, right? And that's what led to that blog post was I looked into it and really read the code closely and was like, yeah, this is literally just a directory structure and a config file, which is plain text and stupid simple to construct, right? Like I, it's in the blog post. It's five lines at most. Yeah. And I was like, this has got it. This is, it's pretty easy. I, it seems too easy. I effectively nerd sniped myself, saying, hey, "Yeah, this is going to be hard to make work for Debian users. We'll give them an error message. I don't want to go down that road of trying to work around them not shipping it." And then I nerd sniped myself into solving the problem in under 100 lines of Python code. <laughs> okay. And so that's why that came about. Was hopefully in the next stable release, which would be the one at the beginning of May. The hope is we'll have the work done such that even if you don't have Venv installed, we'll still be able to create you a virtual environment. We won't have the activation scripts available because I don't want to maintain activation scripts for f- multiple sh- uh, shells. And technically, they're not necessary because you can actually run a virtual environment by path. The activation scripts are just nice to have for when you work in a terminal. Okay. So you just don't need it. So, so yeah, VS Code can be active, quote unquote, then the, yeah. the environment, it could be using it. Yeah, well, so yeah, we don't actually, yeah, so we solved it by literally just not requiring it. So f- as an example, when you hit the run button, right, in VS Code, yeah, what we do is we just specify the full pass of the virtual environment and then Python just knows that it's a, a virtual environment and just handles it, right? There is no necess- There is no requirement that you actually activate that terminal, right? You don't have to put Python on path I mean, honestly, all those all those activation scripts do is three things. They tweak your prompt. Yeah. They put the bin or scripts directory, depending on which OS you're on, at the front of path. And they set a virtual underscore env environment variable to the directory of the virtual environment. That's it. And that virtual that virtual e, e and v uh, environment variable, Python doesn't even use it. Okay. It's just a thing to let you easily tell back how to go back to the directory, but you can even calculate that without it. So none of it is necessary for Python. It's purely just for your usability if you find it useful. I honestly never use it. Okay. But you're primarily in VS Code. I'm in VS Code, and honestly, the, I designed the Python launcher for Unix. Yeah, that's Specifically it. so I didn't have to activate anymore. So it's actually designed for my workflow for, perfectly because <laughs> which does the same kind of thing though. yeah exactly it just type, innately type just py exactly it just knows yeah the the py uh command tool that i wrote for unix there's the one for windows it's a slightly different but in that one is detects is there a dot venv directory if so just automatically find the python in there and just run it like because i don't have to do anything special to make that execute okay so yeah so i wrote micro so that we can just embed it in vs code in the extension so that you will just always have a way to create a virtual environment. And then on top of that, I realized that there's a cool little trick we can do to get you PIP. So there's a website called bootstrap.pypa.io, which contains PIP and virtual env files, right? Just basically the wheels and other things. But on there, there's also a PYZ file, which is basically a zip file containing Python code that Python can execute. And one of them is pip.pyz. Okay. So what we can do is after we create your virtual environment, if you don't have pip, we can actually go on, go to bootstrap.pypa.io, download that pip.pyz file into the internal extension cache, plop it down, and just point your virtual environment at it and just say, hey, go install pip. And then that can grab it from PyPI, install it into the virtual environment, and then effectively 
short of those activation scripts, it's no different than what Vem would have given you. Okay. And it's all just bootstraps itself up, right? And then suddenly it's just fully usable. VS Code can use it fine. You can use it fine. As I said, the only thing that's not there are those activation scripts. And there's very myriad of ways to not have to use them. As I said, they're not required. It's just a nice thing. And it would grab the latest one also, as opposed to having to yeah, I, potentially yeah. update it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, basically, for simplicity's sake, we will probably literally just download that file and just say install pip from PyPI to... That way we can cache it. So if there's like if we download it on like day one of a release of the extension, and then Pip makes a new release halfway through the month, we're still we'll always install the newest version for you into the virtual environment, but you don't have to worry about uh, the one being cached out of date. It also just means we don't have to think about installing what's in the zip file into your virtual environment or you having to rely on VS Code to do installs for that virtual environment. Right? It makes that virtual environment self-contained. Okay. Right, like a key thing for us, at least for VS Code, is we want to be a tool uh, and an editor that works with your setup. We don't want to require you to use us to be your setup, right? It, so we don't want to make it so that if you stop using VS Code, your setup, your your workspace, and everything you set up stops working because you we're using some magic we provided. We try to hook into what you already want and just give you a nice. UI for it and just integrate among other things, right? So we wanted to make sure so if you said you could go, yeah, if you went and use yeah, Sublime you could go text right to the terminal or and, terminal, yeah, Emacs, whatever you want. If for some reason you walk away from VS Code, that virtual environment will still have pip installed in it. Versus, oh, I don't have pip right now. VS Code was giving me that feature, but I stopped using it, so now I'm kind of in a bad spot. How now I got to recreate this virtual environment? It's like, yeah, yeah, we didn't want you to be in that situation. Hence, why we're installing pip into the virtual environment itself. Okay, that makes sense. One of the things that you did in your sort of experimentation going into it is you use the the Vem tool to say, don't install pip. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you're in your exploration of that and you realize, wow, this is really fast yeah. <laughs> and tiny. You're like, and I did the same just to try to practice it. And I was like, oh, that was like instantaneous because mm-hmm. it's not downloading pip and installing it. And then I thought, okay, well, I know I have this uh, virtual environment. What can I do? And I can't really do much. Like, like y- you can't without pip. I was like trying to think. Well, can I call the system pip or do other kinds of things? And it felt like that was kind of broken. Like that was difficult for me to do. And maybe maybe there is a reason why you wouldn't want pip in your virtual environment. But I'm, I'm trying to think of like you know kind of pluses and minuses there. Um, it definitely would make it smaller, but in some ways it breaks a lot of functionality yeah so so you you so yeah so i did i so i pointed that on the blog post because i wanted to make very clear the the difference between creating a virtual environment and installing things because people conflate the two because historically yeah. they happen simultaneously or you do them one after the other right because right. people kind of don't think about the fact that when you create a virtual environment it historically automatically installed set of tools and pip as part of the creation but those are those are steps that it's doing. Exactly. Yeah. But if you choose not to do that, the actual creation of the virtual environment is instantaneous almost. Like on Linux or on any Unix based system, right? It's three sim links, one file, and three directories. Yeah. Maybe maybe a fourth sim link just because of lib sixty four, right? Like that literally that's it. That is all. It is crazy fast. And on Windows Instead of those sim links, those three sim links, you're copying over like two files or three files. I can't remember. I didn't bother supporting Windows with MicroVenv because Windows always, the Windows installs all come with Venv and PIP. So it's just not a problem. Yeah. But so, but as you said, like without it, how do you, how do you make that useful? Right. Because the whole point of virtual environments is to isolate what you install. Yeah. Well, so there's, there's a couple ways to deal with that. So one is pip actually has a dash dash Python flag that you can specify the path to the Python you want to install into. Uh. So you can do that. So that's one way to do it. The other way is if you point to that pip.pyz file I, I mentioned earlier, like you could totally just point your Python at that and have that copy be the copy that gets used for pip to install into. So you don't even have to... So that's another way to kind of get a global copy that's usable by any of your other Python versions versus the one that's installed into the 
site packages, the global install point for your stuff, your stuff for your interpreter. And then the third one is maybe you don't want to use pip, right? Pip happens to be the tool we all use for installs, but it's technically doesn't have to be. Okay. Now there's not a lot of alternatives out there right now, but maybe there will be someday. Right. So for me, the key thing there really is just pointing out the fact that I, I, I'm just trying to help the community kind of think about the fact that just because something has always worked that way doesn't mean it has to work that way. And there are all alternative ways to work with it to make things work. Like, for instance, something I actually talked to Brian Aachen about at Podcast Gates is an idea I have with the Python launcher for Unix, right? Like right now, as I kind of alluded to earlier, it follows my workflow, which means it automatically finds the .v and v directory in the workspace or higher and automatically just uses that, right? It's, it's, it's almost like implicit activation, right? It just finds that path and just runs that path and everything just works. Yeah. Well, I have had this idea of supporting subcommands with the launcher. And, the inter- and then that way kind of, kind of like get subcommands or cargo subcommands if you're a Rust user, right? And the idea of being like, being able to install some commands that can then ask the Python launcher, like, hey, what Python interpreters do you know about? Or what one would you have launched? And then that way you can do something interesting based on that knowledge. And one interesting thing I realized is, well, with that pip.pyz file, that would actually mean I only need one copy of pip ever on my machine, and I only have to keep one copy of pip ever updated. Because if I always point my Python interpreter at that zip file that'll just be the version of pip that I use. And we all get that whole, your version of pips outdated, you might want to update it prompt regularly, right? Right, right, yeah. Well, imagine if it was just one copy of pip that you have to keep updated because it's that zip file. And you can just have one copy of that zip file somewhere on your machine. So my dream at this point is to eventually add subcommand support to the Python launcher for Unix and have a pi pip command. And what that pip command would do is would just ask the Python launcher, hey, what interpreter or environment were you going to use? Uh, oh, I was going to use this one. Okay, cool. I'm just going to run that interpreter, point it at that zip file, and all the other flag arguments, command line arguments I passed into this subcommand, I'll just pass down to pip and just have it work. And then I can get real fancy, right? It's like, you know what? I'm also going to require that I found a virtual environment. And if I don't find a virtual environment, I'll just automatically create one. Because guess what? I have VAMV, and if I don't, I just wrote microvamv, so I can literally embed that code. Like you may have noticed in microvamv's documentation, I specifically say it's small enough to pass on the command line argument. It's so tiny. The reason I did that is I could embed that into a Rust binary and just literally just go path to Python dash C string constant out of my Rust code and have it automatically just create me a virtual environment in the .v and v directory without pip. And then I could just once again point at that zip file in my subcommand and have it just run and just automatically do that behind the scenes. So I never even have to think about creating a virtual environment. I can also automatically have it update that that zip file behind the scenes. So that one copy I have that works on all the installed supported versions of Python is always up to date. I can have it also try to be really fancy, right? Oh, use dash dash target, right? So you're specifying where you want pip to install. One shortcoming with the pip require venv. Uh, environment variable is it always requires it, even if you specify a target. I can make it fancy and go like, oh, you specified that that command line argument? I'm going to not require that yeah. because I can handle that requirement at the command level for the Python launcher. right? So it just opens up some very interesting opportunities when you start to think about the fundamental building blocks that we're working with here and how can we maybe manipulate things to work for certain workflows. And this is mine, right? Like this is my opinionated personal workflow that I already kind of do, just automated to the nth degree. And I just happen to have written the right tools to make this all happen for myself someday. So this is why I had this whole concept of not installing PIP into the virtual environment, because technically you don't have to. And there are some interesting opportunities if we don't, and we can kind of get the tooling around it to make it so it's not necessary. Yeah, some things to think about for, (laughs) you know, upcoming stuff, so. Plus, and as I said, you also just have to deal with the fact that it's not on Debian, so got to kind of figure out some solution to it. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course, the Python Standard Shell, or REPL, read, eval, print loop, 
allows you to run Python code interactively while working on a project or learning the language. And this tool comes with every Python installation, so you can use it at any moment. And this course dives deep into the topic and is titled Getting the Most Out of the Python Standard REPL. It's based on RealPython tutorial by Leodanas Pozo Ramos. And the video course is presented by Darren Jones. And he takes you through how to run the Python standard REPL or interactive shell, and how to write and execute Python code within an interactive session, how to quickly edit, modify, and reuse code in a REPL session, how to get help and introspect your code within an interactive session, and how to tweak some of the features of the standard REPL using a startup file. He also covers how to colorize output using the Rich library and how to identify the standard REPL's missing features that might be covered by an alternative REPL. And he showcases a handful of them. If you've been using Python for a while, you've most likely spent some time within a Python REPL, but maybe you aren't getting the full use out of it. And this course is a good investment in your time if you could use some of these tips and invaluable if you're just starting your Python journey. Like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code examples for the technique show. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. One of the things that I think we kind of touched on a little bit, you had that classifying uh, Python virtual environment workflows. That was your one where you were sort of questioning people online. And, and I think we kind of hit that pretty well. Mm -hmm. And we touched on like how you typically create virtual environments and the kind of the mirroring that you do of your GitHub kind of layout as far as the directory structure. Mm -hmm. What I'm wondering about is kind of the reverse of all this, if you will, the, mm -hmm. okay, now I want to share my code. I want to distribute it and I want to package it. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting kind of watching as somebody as a commentator on the Python world to kind of see a lot of conversation happening. There was the survey that the Python Packaging Authority did, and that generated even more kind of conversations. And I don't know, like, uh, I think some people are more upset than others about the, the <laughs> idea that, that, that it's complex. I don't have that level of agita about it. It's like, I... I find that a tool and I use that tool and as long as it's still around and supported, then I'm, I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of wonder like, you know, some of it, some of your thoughts on it, but also like what tools are you using? And there's like the one weird thing about it was like, I went to look at this stuff and I hadn't surveyed it in quite a while. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there's three new tools I'd never heard of. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of Russell, who we mentioned in the last episode, um, he had commented on it and he had said, it's like, and these are ones that are now considered supported and, and are, you know, sort of suggested by the Python packaging authority and they were new and it was like, okay, which was very interesting. So I don't know, just maybe we could start with like, what are you using for packaging yourself? And has that, changed a lot recently so my needs are a little weird okay just because of the projects i work on so for instance i'm one of the co-maintainers of the packaging library right and that that is a base low level library that tries to implement a bunch of the packaging peps okay right it, it is the the library that most people use to parse versions numbers hmm. and to parse like requirement specifications and that kind of thing all right so because a lot of linux distros and such like to bootstrap up from a clean system everything we personally use flit for packaging but that's because flit has no dependencies so like a linux distro can then just download a zip download the wheel file unzip it manually copy the files in the right spot and then suddenly they can build packaging from scratch, which is one of the baseline requirements for a lot of projects, and then kind of work their way up to getting a fully working Python system that they built from source code directly, right? Okay. So to be clear, I have some weird requirements around this stuff. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You, do not consider what I do normal. <laughs> You're um, a special so case. <laughs> I use, we use Flit on that project. I've used Hatchling 
as other ones, just because Hatchling automatically cares about what you're, what's in your Git repo uh, versus not when it creates a source distribution. Okay. Which is kind of a cool little thing to have because then I don't have to think about it. My source distributions for like microvem just include everything that's in the Git repo. Done. It just puts it up on the tarball. It's all done. And then it'll build the wheels as appropriate. So it's all taken care of. After that, honestly, everything else I, I out of habit, do manually, right? I use Vem to create my virtual environments. Honestly, at this point, I use the create environment command because I get to help dictate the feature set. So I got to work with my team to make it do what I want. So it does exactly what I Works want. Works great for me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and honestly, to be clear, that, that whole flow is actually designed specifically to be opinionated because we're trying to do what we think would make sense for beginners. And if it works for advanced users, fantastic. But we it isn't geared towards them specifically because we know you, advanced users can use a terminal. Yeah, you, you can just write the command out. But yeah, otherwise, literally my workflow is either I use the create environment command to create my virtual environments or I use Vim. I use my Python launcher to run Python to launch it anytime I have to run anything manually. Okay. Otherwise, just use VS Code to run stuff. Uh, I'm a Nox user, personally, for Task Runner. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. Okay. And I feel like Hatchling is is kind of newish, but I, I maybe it's just me not being aware of it. It's newish. The name feels like it came from eggs, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. So not directly. That's just kind of the play of it. I know. I, I know they're having fun with the name. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. So Hatchling is the build tool, is the build system provided by Hatch. So that's the relationship. Okay. So Hatch is the higher higher level tool that will like auto create virtual environments and manage those for you and lets you configure different virtual environment needs for like testing versus other things and specify what versions of Python you want, create virtual environments for each of those and stuff like Hatch is the one is one of those is a workflow tool, right? So it tries to manage your entire workflow and help you be successful that way. Hatchling is just a build system. Okay. Once again, because I've been doing this for as long as I have, I just have my own workflow that just I'm happy to just type out manually, and I just don't use those higher workflow tools okay. like Hatch or Poetry or Pipm, just because I don't need them. It's just not necessary for me. I've got my, I, I use Starship. I've got the Python launcher. I know what commands to run, and it all just works for me. So I just don't bother. Okay. I know lots of people who absolutely love Hatch. And love that kind of workflow tooling that kind of manages all that stuff for them. So I, I can speak well of Hatch. Some people absolutely love poetry. Some don't. Some people are like me and do stuff and do, but still use virtual env wrapper to manage stuff because they want once again those virtual environments. Yeah, that's my co-host Christopher. He's uh, on virtual env wrapper. And yeah, because he wants to name his environments very specifically. Yeah, and... but I'm I, I'm personally I don't reuse my virtual environments, so I don't need to give them fancy names, and I want them to be easily picked up by, by VS Code. So that's why I'm not. But I totally get why people like that that flow. Yeah, great for them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Personally, I am literally a Python launcher, Knox to run stuff. Python launcher, and otherwise it's whatever we provide in VS Code because I get to make that happen. So, okay. Do you have any opinions on the survey and and kind of some of the stuff that's found? And I feel like that's another is that another one of the summits that's happening. Is there a packaging summit that's happening at PyCon? There's a packaging summit. It's actually split it, because it got organized a bit late. It's split between two days. It's split. It's okay. Friday. It's Friday morning and Sunday morning at PyCon. Okay. And I do have opinions. I, so one thing I found really interesting, just because I've been at this for so long, is listening to the complaint, how the complaints have changed over the years. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, everyone complains about packaging. Like, I don't care what, wh- who, who, who you are or where you're from, you're going to complain about packaging, even in other ecosystems. They got them. <laughs> they got yeah, them exactly. complaints. <laughs> But uh, there's historical context that's missing here that's making people, I think, feel frustrated without realizing the historical context of it all, right? Because once again, Python was released in February of 1991. It predates Linux. And people forget that constantly. Python predates wide usage of the World Wide Web. Like Guido was working on one of the very first graphical browsers out there called Gradle, right? Like he was working on it while uh, NCSA Mosaic was being developed, right? Like it's that old. Back when I first started using 
Python, I downloaded my packages from the Vaults of Parnassus, which was a website maintained by someone in the community that had animated gifts of wall sconces <laughs> and <laughs> candelabras and just up BB. <laughs> downloaded zip files, right? Like that was how I got my code. Like literally, or people posted the code to Usenet, right? All right. So I, I, I go back that far. And people were, back then, it was like, oh, it's hard to find stuff. Where do we find stuff? There's no tooling around this stuff, blah, blah, blah. So PyPI PyPI came about, setup tools came about, easy install came about, right? And then that kept going and going. And then people started to complain about having to use setup tools for everything, right? And PIP came about, right? But people are still, for to replace easy install, but people will still complain about setup tools, right? And setup.py and all this stuff. So... I started work to make set of tools a choice instead of a requirement, right? And that's where pyproject.toml came in. And be able to specify all your project metadata in pyproject.toml to make it much easier to switch between projects. Yeah. And then suddenly we had this proliferation of tooling around this, right? From workflow tools like like Pipm, then Poetry, and then now Hatch, and um, PDM was also in there as well. I think PDM came after Poetry. And these new build backends that make it so you don't have to use setup tools to build your wheels and stuff. And now people are complaining about having too many options. And yet just... Yeah, it's big I mean, it feels like just a few years ago, but I mean, it maybe it was a decade. People are complaining about not having any options. <laughs> right. Right. So it's one of these very funny things where people just don't know the historical context. Like the whole reason there's been this proliferation is it was kind of on purpose, like we specifically for the back ends, especially right. The tools that make you your wheel files and make you your source distributions, the things you that make the things that go up on PyPI. Right. Like that was totally on purpose so that there was enough flexibility so that you could get your job done. Right. Like, like the PyO3 and Maturin stuff for Rust, that was not necessarily as easily possible as when setup tools kind of had a stranglehold on everything. Right. The fact that the scientific community is able to build all of their stuff using their own tool chain is, and not have to hack around set of tools with those like 10,000 line patches and crazy things that they do to that. Like they don't need that anymore. Right. They're automatically running commands and things. Right. Like that. So that's yeah. all worked out well. Yeah. And people are actually not really complaining much about that now. Now they're just complaining about all the workflow tools that are suddenly become a possible. But honestly, there was nothing that really motivated that. It's just people decided they wanted to automate virtual environment creation along with their packaging. And so people just started to go further and further along of what can I automate? Cause the stuff that needed that they wanted to automate earlier in the steps got good enough that they could and were happy with it. So it was like, what's the next pain point I want to solve for? And so it just it slowly crept into bigger and bigger tools that just do more and more for you, which can be a good or bad thing depending on perspective. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Like the the perspective seems to be just that there's just too many choices, which is it's kind of weird, you know, in, in what you're saying, it, you know, it's like kind of walking onto a car lot and saying, oh my God, there's too many choices. And it's like, exactly. well, okay, you're going to have specific needs. Yep. <laughs> Find the tool. And, you know, I know for a beginner, I mean, that's why I do the show is like, I, I have to ask these questions and try to find out like, what are the tools and what, what, what do people suggest and get opinions and, yeah. and so forth. And, and packaging is complex and, that what you're saying makes sense, the history behind it. Yeah. So well, and the funny thing is, is packaging is only complex when you don't use pure Python. Uh, yes. If you wrote just Python code, it's really straightforward. It's when you decide to go outside that boundary that things get complicated. And it's actually not Python's fault, right? And that's the other thing I think a lot of people yeah, forget. That's true. So to be clear, it, it gets complicated because people want to make it complicated. It's uh, kind of like if you think about it, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Like if all you're doing is using Pure Python, just you have pure Python wheels, right? It's literally just a zip file, right? Pip can just install those instantaneously. Hell, you can work, you can just install those and use them with WebAssembly, right? They just plop down and they just run, right? That's the magic of .py files in Python. But as soon as you want to add that bit of C code or that bit of REST code or the bit of Fortran code, things get really complicated really fast. I think the other reason beginners, by the way, want an answer is because they either are in a rush. Yes. They don't want to take the time or they're afraid of making the wrong decision based on a lack of knowledge. Yeah. I mean, their brain can only hold so many ideas in their head at the moment right now. Yeah. And honestly, I, I think it's 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 a bit of, there's a term, it's um, like 
it's not abundance paralysis, but basically when you freeze out, when you have too much choice. Yeah. And I think that's what happens with beginners is, like, oh my God, there's just too many options. As you said, like walking on the car lot and going, like, oh, there's too many choices here. It was like, or walking the cereal aisle. And, yeah, and it's exactly. Like, <laughs> like what kind of, what kind of ketchup do I want to buy? There's so many options, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's unfortunate, but technically it doesn't matter in the end. And honestly, for a lot of these tools, the, the cost of changing isn't huge. The, the end result, like it still has to land and, and be available, you know, like there's still like a, a, a good single, well, primarily single distribution point. Right. Like oh, the, your configuration is going to go in your pi project at Tomble. As much of that's going to be consistent. After that, they're going to create virtual environments, which tools understand, and they're going to install stuff, which tools understand. So you might have to tweak your config to say like, oh, well, Poetry wants it written this way, while Hatch wants it written this way for how to create my environments. But otherwise, all the other stuff's the same and the concepts are all the same. It's still creating a virtual environment for some version of Python you have installed and it's still running the code. So it, it's just whose commands look nicer to you, really, at the end. And who adds that little extra finesse or yeah. shininess to the commands that they provide or configuration options that you feel you need or want to let you get there. But the whole point is to try to get all this so that you're working with standards and artifacts that everyone agrees to at the bottom layer. So this is really just a UI choice. It's not a critical aspect, right? Like this is why I, I am on a very long-term multi-year project to try to get us lock file support yeah, yeah so yeah. that people stop viewing that as a, I have to use this other tool here because it has lock files and no other tool has that, or it doesn't quite work the way I need it to work or what have you. Right. Like I, I feel like that, like lock files is the last artifact that we don't have standardized that if we could, all of these tools just become just, just UX decisions. Yeah. It wouldn't be a feature set decisions at that fundamental level. And all that conversation about, you know, security and typo squatting and all this other kind of weird yeah, stuff. Well, not just like typo squatting, well, but reproducibility it, it runs the gamut. Um, I'm working on yeah. it, but it's going to take a very long time. I, it, it, it already sank two years into it and it led to a, a reject. It like, I think a yeah. ten months into a pep <laughs> that got rejected ultimately, and that was, yeah, that was one of our last conversations. Yeah, yeah, a year and a half February ago, of twenty twenty two, it got rejected, yeah. and so I've been working since then to try to build up more or less my own installer that can do its own lock files as a proof of concept to show what it looks like, and hmm. show that this is feasible and it works, and this is what I would propose, and to try to at least get people to rally around something so that we can get it accepted. So I am working on it. Have you done that before for other uh, projects where you felt like, all right, I I truly got to show what this looks like and what this workflow is like? It really to, depends. To buy in. Yeah. I know that works out at, at like a job that's a, a common thing for yeah. me is I need to stand something up, you know, um, and, and kind of show like a, a bit of a concept um, in order to get buy-in. I think it depends on, for me personally, I'm very lucky, right? I have a very specific position in this community and in the the realms of the community that I run around in. And I happen to have been around long enough that I have the right connections in a lot of places that I know who to talk to for things. Sure. So if I have a really fully formed idea and I really feel like it's a good idea and I know the right people to talk to about it and to make sure they can check my ideas and all that stuff. Uh-huh. I can get away with not having to pr- do that proof of concept to prove to people that it works. But if it's kind of hazy, I kind of want to do it just to figure out the what's wrong and what doesn't work and then go like, here, I got a proof of concept over here. Does this look reasonable? People, can we do it over, right? Like like the import system, right, is a good example. I, I couldn't just say, let's rewrite that in Python. Like I had to do import lib and do all that and then prove that I could get performance up and it had all the right APIs and all that stuff. And then I was able to go like, now can we get rid of all that C code? And then we go, yes, right. But other times I've written entire peps where I did not have to pre-create anything because I had enough of a solid idea and I knew it could be implemented that I could just propose the idea, get it accepted and then just implement the thing. That's nice. Yeah. So it really varies, but I fully admit I'm in a very unique position. But as I just pointed out, I don't always win on that one either. Even when <laughs> yeah, I do true. come up with an idea right. that I think I have consensus on, I can still lose that battle, have that pep rejected, and in this case, have to go like, okay, I still think this is important, so I'm still going to try to prove something anyway. Yeah, cool. But um, the other thing 
I want to say about this that I think is a misunderstanding is I think people, yeah, just don't understand how much the complexity comes, not from Python itself, but from Python being asked to do what it does, right? Being the glue of the internet is fantastic. Yeah. And it's a freaking curse. Yeah. Right. Because it's great that we have all these packages on PyPI and we can be used in so many places and be so useful for people. But it means people try to contort Python in the most am- amazing ways and scary ways and try to make it work and get upset when it doesn't quite work. Right. Like if you look at the Z community, the C community does not have a standard tool for building C and C projects. There are multiple ones and they all build differently. And they all lead to different outcomes. And you have to make sure in, in trying to get them all to compile to a thing that can be loaded by Python takes work. Same with Fortran. Rust is a little more straightforward. But my point is, is a lot of the complexity around packaging is just trying to make all that crazy stuff in this other part of the universe that is native code, like C, C++, all that extension module stuff. A lot of that complexity in the packaging is because of that. Yeah. If we all just wrote straight pure Python code, no problem. All our problems go away tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But we don't live in that world. So it's another thing where I feel like people come in and complain about the difficulty in all this without stopping to think about why is it difficult? Yeah. Like none of this is for fun. No one wants to have this level of complexity. We don't, no one tries to reach out for this. It just yeah. ends up being something someone somewhere needed to make something work. And it's probably being used by a decent number of people now because the community is so big. And not having that around would probably break someone, right? And that's the other thing. Like, people complain, as you said, about too many options. I can guarantee you that person who says that would be very upset if we chose one and it was not the workflow that they liked. Didn't have their thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm thinking of. Right? Like, you hear this all the time from people. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should choose one workflow. It's like, well, it's not going to be that one. Like, but that's the one I like. It's like, well, but you said just choose (laughs) one, right? Like, you see this all the time when people go like, oh, well, you should choose Conda or you should choose PIP. It's like, okay, well, we'll, I'll choose the one that you don't use. Like, oh, no, 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 but my one's better. It's like, well, it's not better or worse. It's just different. (laughs) Right, Right. and yours works for you and the other one works for this person. Yeah, Someone's going to be upset. And so it's just, it's interesting when when people come in and they don't stop to think about all these perspectives and these needs and the historical context of it all and come in like... Yeah, they have a myopic view and, it, you know, it's like they're in front of their computer and these are the tools that I use and why can't everybody else be doing the same thing as me to a point, you know. To a point. And some people honestly just come from a place of just accidental ignorance, right? Like some people are just going like, oh, everyone must just work this way because because right. that's what I was taught or what I learned. Every, everybody in my building does, right? Exactly, you know? everyone at work does, <laughs> right? Like this is something yeah. I tell my team all the time at work when we deal with GitHub issues, right, is... You have you have to approach every issue assuming this person probably is not probably has not had a conversation potentially potentially with anyone outside of their friends, family, and coworkers who all live in the same town in some country somewhere that is not where you're from. Right, and that's not a crazy statement to actually make, right? If you really stop and think about it, it is very easy if you don't think about us traveling to PyCon US, right? Like during the pandemic. I was just here in BC. I actually have not left the country since the pandemic started. PyCon US is going to be my first international trip since February of 2020. Yeah. Right. I, and I had not left the province of British Columbia until I went back East uh, to visit friends earlier in late 2022. So it was not totally crazy for, for that perspective. I luckily have enough coworkers internationally and I have enough friends in the Python community and all that, that I talk to people all over the world all the time. But it is totally reasonable to think that people don't yeah. have that exposure, which it also extends to their tool chains. So it's very easy for them to come in and go like, oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you probably don't know the history of this. So just so you know, Python's really old. We predate, like, why can't you do this like NPM? Or why can't you do this like Rush? It's like, well, they learned from us, <laughs> right? That doesn't mean we can't learn from them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But you have to understand, they learned from our mistakes. It's not like we suddenly ignored what they did and came up with our own thing is like no no no, we were already doing stuff Come check out this timeline <laughs> yeah they looked at us and like oh yeah maybe we should do it differently or something and then they did it and then now you're getting this comparison but yeah. it's not like oh in blank like 
in August of 2012, Python and, and the Node committees both sat down independently and both chose their own approach and didn't talk to each other and look at how we ended up. Like, that's not how these timelines work. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's, but it's understandable how people end up in this position. And some people are really good about understanding this when you do explain it to them, right? Like, yeah. once again, historical context, what we're working with here, what we're doing to be flexible, right? Like, once again, you want us to simplify your lives? We can. You will probably not get the workflow you want. You're going to lose access to all those extension modules and all those integrations, right? Like all you, all the data scientists, guess what? You would suddenly lose all of your AI integrations because that's all mostly written in C++ underneath at the bottom layers, right? All that GPU access, they ain't doing that in pure Python, right? Like yeah. all this stuff would just disappear, right? All this stuff people wrote to be faster, hopefully the faster C Python team continues to make things faster so that people just stop reaching for C for that perspective, right? Like right. you don't need Cython as much anymore and all that stuff to make things go faster. Just write your Python. It just gets faster for free every release to some extent, or at least over time, like ne- not necessarily every release. No, pr- I don't want to put that kind of pressure on the faster C Python team, but at least uh, <laughs> yeah, over time continue sure. to get faster. But I think people just have to take a step back. It's like, well, you're, what you're doing might be simple. By the way, your dependencies, what they're doing might not be simple. Yeah. Right. And just trying to make all this plug in, right. And just make all this work. It's just, it just is a hard problem with this level of flexibility. Yeah. Uh, it totally makes sense. Yeah. And that's something that is hard to interject into the conversation. Yeah. And- and you know, make sure that's happening. So yeah. that's my feedback on overall that whole discussion. In terms of outcomes, yeah. I think there I think everyone's still kind of processing what's going on. And I think everyone's kind of taking a step back. It'll be interesting to see what comes up at the packaging summit at PyCon. Yeah. And if anything, any fruition from those discussions comes about. I think there is an interesting question there about whether it's time to establish kind of like a cancel setup or something, because the at least on the PyPA side of things, it's not anarchy completely exactly, but it is very leaderless by design, hmm. right? Like Paul Moore and I think Donald Stuff technically are both uh, people who can be delegated to to make decisions on packaging paths without talking to the steering council. But I mean, that's a lot to ask of one person and driving in, Paul isn't directly driving visions or anything on purpose. He's just trying to go based on consensus and any gut feel he might have to have on whether a pep gets accepted. Yeah. But maybe it's time to have that discussion. Maybe it's time to have a very small, discrete group of people who are people put their trust in. It's like, okay, go off and think things through and figure something out. Because asking the world leads to multi hundred uh, post threads on <laughs> discuss.python.org, which on multiple platforms, <laughs> which run the gamut. Yeah. Right. And once again, right. everyone has an opinion and everyone's opinion is different. Yeah. Cause once again, everyone wants, has different needs, especially at this layer. So it might be time for some people just have to, I don't know, make some tough calls and just have to tell some people, Nope, we're not doing that. We're going to do this. And this is the way it's going to look. And yeah, or this, or or this is the way we're choosing to not make decisions, right? Like maybe w- multiple tools is okay with us, and this is it. it or here's some um, coordination points or something. I I don't know, it, but I think that discussion is probably going to be had this shortly, and we'll make a decision. I don't know if it'll happen, but that was at least an interesting thing that came out of that discussion. Was do we want to have a more structured way of having decisions made? Yeah, sounds like you're gonna have a pretty busy PyCon. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna be busy anyway. I mean, I, I've got yeah, I've got the language summit. I'm leading the Web Assembly summit. I've got my talk, and then I think I'm giving a Ask Me Anything at the Microsoft booth. So okay, on top of all the hallway track talks and the packaging summit, as you said, yeah, yeah so it's gonna include yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't get to have, I, my, my my PyCons are fun, but they're not relaxing. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Well. I have these weekly questions I like to ask, and uh, we skipped them for our previous episode, but I thought we could uh, wrap them up here. What's something that you're excited about in the world of Python right now? I will say the whole WASI stuff around Python, I'm a little excited about. It's not ex- short-term excited. Yeah. It's long-term excited. But as I said, I'm starting to participate at the level of the Bytecode Alliance and having conversations with people over there about things, and I'm starting to get hints and some thoughtful people having some thoughtful looks on their faces when I talk about some of the challenges I see for the Python community around this and going like, yeah, I think we might be able to come up with a solution around this. Yeah. Once again, slow turning wheels because it's all standards, but 
I'm going to be very interested to see where this all ends up. And can we like, can my, my, my dream of making this maybe make it easier to make like the whole concept of single file binaries or make it easier to distribute stuff. Cause you compile it once for all something and just runs everywhere else. That kind of thing. Like, can that dream come true? Like, yeah, I'm excited about distribution. And that is, you know, always the kind of been the weird thing as a programmer is like, how do I show people that I've done code and that, without sitting them in, on my computer mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to look at the thing running. Yeah. And so, um, and you know, phone, we've talked about phones, we've talked about tablets and other kinds of things and it's just lots of exciting stuff and the web solves quite a bit of it, but, but yeah, there's definitely need for more. So I'm excited about that too. Yeah. What's something that you want to learn next? And this doesn't have to be programming or Python. It could be any topic. So I am perpetually learning Rust. So probably a bit more Rust and concurrency and partway through the second edition of the Programming Rust book. Okay. Uh, I've been reading that fairly slowly because of the Python launcher for Unix. That's my pet project from that's just for me. That's the one you generated from it, from your Rust experiment? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Basically, when I started to learn Rust, I wanted to have a project yeah. for it. And... When I uh, started at Microsoft, I hadn't been a Windows user for ages. So I started to be a Windows user again, and I actually kind of liked the um, Python launcher on Windows. And I was like, but then I started to use WSL, and the Python launcher wasn't there. And I kept going, like, oh, man, I kind of missed this. It was kind of nice to just type <laughs> Pi and have it just do the right thing. And I didn't have to worry about installation order of, of like, what was the last version I installed? So if that would be what Python 3.2 instead of what the newest version was and all that. So yeah i it just matched up with when i was learning rust so i made that my project and it's been a lot of fun and as i talked about earlier i have i want to do a pi pip thing that does exactly what i want so i really don't have to ever think about anything and <laughs> so i just want to learn a bit more rust probably leaning a bit more on the concurrency thing and just kind of play off that and just yeah. continue to make that my that's a good book yeah yeah it's fun it's entertaining it's 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 Obviously, not a light light read. I do read it in bed, but that doesn't say much because I will I read that kind of stuff for fun. Yeah, but yeah, it's a good book. It's thick. You definitely will learn the language, though. Okay. But yeah. How can people follow along with the work that you do online? What are the best ways to do that? So depends if it's uh, what you're exactly looking for. So there's my blog, snarky.ca, s n a r k y dot c a. So I blog there. Fair warning, the blog posts are typically not short, hence why they're not <laughs> frequent like weekly or necessarily monthly. Yeah. I am on Mastodon. I'm Brett Cannon at Fossadon.org. If you're more interested in the work stuff, like the VS Code related stuff, you can either follow the Python blog for that. Uh, that's aka.ms slash Python blog. Or you can just follow the VS Code release notes for the really high level the the high level really important stuff that the Python team does, but more detail and more lower, smaller stuff ends up in our our team blog. That's separate from VS Code, just because it exists before we joined the VS Code team. That's pretty much it. So yeah, personal blog, Mastodon, work blog. Awesome. Well, Brett, thanks again for coming on the show and uh, having these couple conversations with me. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you in uh, Salt Lake City uh, again, catching up again. Yeah, guys, it's only two weeks from now. All right. Can't, I still, my brain has not quite clicked into the fact that I'm going to be traveling that soon. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. See you then. I want to thank Brett Cannon for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.